Good morning, everybody. Um, I have put my face on this. Not sure um, if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I was talking with my wife about it, though. She said I need to put my face on there, and I commented, I don't want to put my stupid face on there. And she said she likes my stupid face. So, you know, huge compliment. Uh, huge words of praise from one who loves me like that. <laughs> All joking aside, uh, I did put my face on here um, as at my wife's request. But we're going to go ahead and begin with our worship service this morning. Uh, and before we do, we'll get a few announcements in, just update you guys on some things. Uh, following the lead of you know others, other churches, uh, following the lead of schools, we don't have a time frame right now about when we'll be back together. Um, some schools are looking at reevaluating at the beginning of May. Some have already said the end of May. So we really don't have much to go on at this point. Um, and again, the current recommendations are you know changing all the time as well, which I know you guys are all familiar with that and aware of that as well. But just keep uh, being people that are in the Word. Also, I just wanted to make a brief encouragement. I was uh, listening and watching a clip that my sister had sent me, and I thought it had some good advice. The clip said, turn off the TV, especially all this news about the coronavirus. Quit watching these news outlets. Quit reading all of the updates on your phone. You know, turn that off. Get your Bible out instead. You know, if you're going to be listening to something, listen to the Word of God. Get into the Word. Use this time. Instead of obsessing on the virus, use this time to obsess on God's Word a little bit more. Get into prayer a little bit more. Go sit outside and, and get rid of those things. And if you're a TV person and that's just what you like to do, let, let me suggest to you that you download maybe uh, the Gospel Broadcasting Network on your smart TV. You can find that easily. has a lot of good stuff. Also, World Video Bible School has stuff that you can download. They have an app for your smart TV or your Roku as well. So good sources of much better information than you're going to get on the news. Um, I would also just suggest to you uh, that you come and pick up the Lord's Supper sometime this week. I'm going to have the building open on Monday, Thursday, uh, both of those from uh, 11 to 3, 11 in the morning to 3 p.m. Then on Saturday, uh, I'll leave it open a little longer from like 10 to 4 p.m. We're going to have bags out there. Some of them still have your names on them because maybe you didn't need them yet. Um, in addition to that, we'll just have some other bags out there. Each bag will contain two individual cups. So get what you need. You know, if your family needs more, grab make your adjustments, just grab what you need. There's also some envelopes out there uh, that you can mail in your contributions. That way, you can mail them in, you can drop them in the, in the, mail, in the mailbox out of the street. The mailbox is very secure, it locks, it's a very uh, secure place to put that, that contribution. So again, those little cups, and now somebody else was talking about the other day, there's bread on top of those. The little, they're little tiny things. Um, and the fruit of the vine is obvious, easy to see, but there's a little wafer on top of that, little white wafer about the size of a nickel, uh, so don't overlook that. If you can't come here to pick up the Lord's Supper, you need it delivered to you, let me know, let my wife know. Uh, we'll make sure that we either bring it to you or we find somebody else who can. Uh, so we need, you know, we want you to be able to take the Lord's Supper uh, and to try to be together as much as we can. I want to begin at this time uh, with the prayer, so if you'll bow with me, in prayer, that would be great. Our Father in heaven, we come before you at this time. We ask you to be with us as we go through these very unusual times, as we endure through difficulties, as we endure through um, sometimes fear. We pray that you may help us, Father, to look to you, to not let these things become something that overwhelms our thoughts and our hearts and our minds, but help us to remember, Father, what we talked about last week, that you are in control. We pray, Father, for um, our own congregation, our own members, that you may help us, help us to be a light to those around us at this time. Help us to look for opportunities to serve, and we know it might be in unusual ways, but help us to seek those opportunities out. Help us to use this in your kingdom to glorify you. We pray again your blessings, your blessings upon our worship service, and it's in Christ we pray. Amen. Uh, I thought we would sing a song as we just to kind of get started here. You'll have to hear my voice. I hope you will sing along there so you can blend me out a little bit. But let's go ahead and sing this song, just a song that I enjoy singing, an uplifting, encouraging song about worshiping God. Love this song. We will glorify the King of Kings. We will glorify the Lamb. We will glorify the Lord of Lords. 
who is the great I am. Lord Jehovah reigns in majesty, we will bow before his throne. We will worship him in righteousness, we will worship him alone. He is Lord of heaven, Lord of earth, he is Lord of all who live. He is Lord above the universe, all praise to him we give. O oh, hallelujah to the King of kings, hallelujah to the Lamb, hallelujah to the Lord of lords, who is the great I am. So let's go ahead at this point, and I'm going to read a passage um, as we prepare for the Lord's Supper. And like we did last week, uh, I'll give you a time where I will just stop talking for a moment, pause the video, take the Lord's Supper, say your prayer, and take that on your own, and then just poke play again. Um, what I like to do when I take the Lord's Supper, and again, there's no wrong reason to do there's no well there are some wrong ways to do this i should say it differently but this is not necessarily the only right way of doing this this is how i like to uh, try to focus my thoughts when it comes to the lord's supper you know uh, this is the first sunday in april so on the first sunday of a month i always go through and read uh, the first gospel something regarding the life the death the, the, re the resurrection of christ i look at that first gospel so in the first month First week of the month, I do Matthew. Second week of the month, I do Mark, so forth. If there's five weeks that month, I will do something different on that fifth uh, that fifth month. Maybe I read 1 Corinthians or something else. But So because it's the first Sunday of the month, I'm going to take you with me as I read from Matthew chapter 26, beginning in verse 36. It says, Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little further, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again for the second time he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass, unless I drink it, your will be done. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words. And then he came to his disciples and said to them, Sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. What a powerful passage. As Jesus says here, Father, it's not my will that I'm doing. It's your will that I'm doing. And so he says, not as I will, but as you will. Here, he says that here in verse 39. Because that was his desire to do the will of the Father. And again, it says he comes with them again. Uh, verse 42 says, my Father, if this, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And what an amazing example, what an amazing uh, tribute to Jesus Christ that he was willing to do the Father's will no matter what the cost was. That he was willing to die and to suffer. And again, all we have to do is come down here a little further in the text to see just how bad things we're going to get for him. It says here, um, verse, uh, verse 62, And the high priest stood up and said, Have you no answer to make? What is it that you, what these men testify against you? But Jesus remained silent, and the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, You have said so. But I tell you, from now on you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, He has uttered blasphemy. What further witnesses do we need? You have now heard this blasphemy. What is your judgment? They answered, He deserves death. And they spit in his face and struck him and some slapped him. At this point, you can pause 
the video and take up the Lord's Supper. Okay, I assume you're back with me at this point. Um, you've taken the Lord's Supper. And so now we're going to go ahead and we're going to get into our lesson a little bit. Um, and so last week, when we were, when we were uh, together, video-wise, we were together last week, and we talked about the fact that things are not always as they seem. You know, we're in this world right now. Things are crazy. Things seem out of control. Uh, we've probably felt out of control our, our normal routine is thrown off. We're not going to work or school or whatever we normally do. We're all, it's all crazy. And it might make us feel like things have gone out of control. But we talked about last week that things aren't out of control. God still is in control. He is still the one on the throne. He is still the one that is reigning. Today I want to talk about another aspect going a little obviously different, but I want to talk about more about what we're going through right now. You know, this coronavirus make, may make us think that God's not in control. He is. This coronavirus uh, may make us sometimes uh, lose heart, lose, lose strength. Uh, and so I want to talk about a word, a Greek word called hupomone. And I've talked about this word several times. Uh, it's a word we've talked about, especially as we've been doing the book of Revelation on Sunday nights. And it's a word that means endurance or steadfastness. Uh, and really, the word talks about how do we respond. The word is dealing with how does someone respond to difficult times, difficult situations. And as I mentioned already, Revelation uses it several times. In fact, I think it uses uses it seven times. Book of Romans uses it several, um, six times to be specific. It occurs 32 times in the New Testament in its entirety. What I want to do is just kind of come through, follow a couple of those words, not in any particular order, but I want to look at those words as they occur in some of the texts, beginning, first of all, with what we have on the screen, the book of Revelation. And again, background for the book of Revelation, which those who are coming Sunday nights, uh, you should be very familiar with the background of this book. But the background of the book is that the Christians are being persecuted at the hands of the Roman government. This powerful government, the most powerful government in the world, the most powerful uh, entity in the world at the time, from a human's point of view, is the Roman government. And they have their sights set on Christians. They have their sights set on the church. And in the book of Revelation, this word hupomone first occurs in John chapter, Revelation chapter 1, beginning in verse 9. It says, I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos, on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. So it begins here, and John says that he is a partner. He's a partner with the Christians in three ways. First of, he, first of all, he's a partner with them in the tribulation. He's a partner in the tribulation, the hardships they're going through. He's a partner in the kingdom. that They were part of a kingdom, even then, 2,000 years ago. They were part of a kingdom. John was a part of that. He said, I'm also a partner with you guys in the patient endurance, the hupomone. And hupomone, this Greek word, I'm going to pull it up for you. I want you to see this Greek word. This Greek word, apparently my, my slide's not working here for me. Let me see if I can slide it up this way. This Greek word, I want you to see it. Bear with me. Look at look at this. Look at the meaning of this word. The capacity to hold out or bear up in the face of difficulty. You could also look at a second definition: the act or state of patient waiting for someone or something. Patiently waiting for someone or something. Does that describe what a Christian is, is should do? Should we be patient as we wait for someone, for Jesus Christ, for something, for you know his final return, for his promises to come true? Looking at the first definition here, it's the capacity. This Greek word, hupomone, it is the capacity to hold out or bear up in the face of difficulty. And my question to you as we kind of begin thinking about this, how are you holding up 
during this difficulty? How are you bearing up? How are you holding out? What are you doing? Are, are you patiently waiting for something, for someone? You see, that's the point here, is that as Christians, I'll drop this back down to give us more scripture on the text here, more screen. Uh, as Christians, we need to be patiently holding out, patiently going through this. You know, John, like the Christians he was writing to, he was going through hard times. Together, as partners, they were holding up together. They were bearing up together in the face of difficulty. A few chapters later, you can see it on the screen here, that same Greek word occurs again. John, Jesus is speaking to the church in Ephesus here in Revelation chapter 2. And they were, look at what he says here, verse 2, I know your works. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance. And how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake. And look at this, and you have not grown weary. What an amazing word of praise that Jesus Christ gives to this church in Ephesus. What an amazing word of praise that, what, that, this, that this is how they were responding during this difficult time. During this difficult time, he says, I know what you guys are going through, and I know you're bearing up. You're holding up well. You're waiting for something or someone bigger, and because you're waiting for something or someone bigger, you're holding up. These things are not causing you to lose your faith. These things are not causing you to question who's on the throne. You're bearing up. He, he offers similar praises to the church in Thyatira. He offers similar praise to the church in Philadelphia. And then the word is not seen again until chapter 13 in the book of Revelation. Let me get there. And we see it as we have the description of the first beast. And again, notice what it says here. Revelation 13, verse 7 and following. And it, the beast, was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And authority was given it, the beast, was given authority over every tribe and people and language and nation. And all who dwell on earth will worship it. Those who dwell on earth, those aren't the Christians. Those, there's, a, there's a clear distinction in the book of Revelation. These are not those who are patiently enduring. These who dwell on earth is a phrase that's used to describe those who are yielding, who are giving up. And all who dwell on earth will worship the beast. Everyone whose names have not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. Now look at what he says in verse 10. If anyone is to be taken captive, to captivity he goes. If anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword he must be slain. Here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. If you're going to be taken captive by the Roman government, that calls for endurance. Bearing up, holding up under that difficult, I mean, difficulty to which the likes of which we can't understand, probably. If you're going to be slain with the sword, that's going to call for some hoopo mone, some endurance. There are things and times in our lives that will occur in our lives that will call for endurance. There's going, to call, there's going to be times and challenges that will call for a capacity to hold up and bear up in the face of difficulty. Sometimes these difficulties are due to sufferings at the hand of wicked men, at the hand of Satan, like they were in the book of Revelation. But sometimes we just need to bear up in difficult situations because sometimes life is hard. It's not always because Satan is attacking you. It's not always because of some evil you've done. Certainly, those can be causes of difficulties. But sometimes life just happens. You know, it's interesting as we go to another example of this word, to look at Jesus' use of this word, the book of Luke, chapter 8, verse 15 here. Jesus is talking about the parable of the sower, the seed. We know this parable very well. Uh, look at what he says in verse Look at verse 13. And the seed on the rock are those 
who, when they hear, they welcome the word with joy. But having no root, these believe for a while and depart in a time of testing. These don't have any, these are not enduring. These are not hupo monein, if I can use that weird word. They're not enduring. They're not bearing up. When a time of testing comes, they don't have any root. Look at verse 15. But the seed in the good soil ground, these are those who, having heard the word with an honest and good heart, hold on to it, and by enduring, there's that word, hupomone, and by enduring, they bear fruit. You see, there's two different kinds of people. Well, there's more than that, but there's two specific ones that I think are applicable to what we're talking about right now. There are those who have no root. And so in a time of testing, like we're going through maybe, hardships that we're going through maybe, the, the things that cause us fear maybe, a time of testing, those who have no root, it, it, they can lose their faith if they're not careful. But the seed that has been sown into the good ground, they hear the word. And their heart, look at how he describes it. It's an honest heart. It's a good heart. And what do these people do? They hold on to it. And because they hupomone, they hold fast, they bear up, they endure because of this, even during these difficult times, they bear fruit. Skip into the book of Hebrews. I love the book of Hebrews. Great book. Uh, and here we have this Greek word, hupomone, again, and it occurs, first of all, in one form, back here in verse 32, actually, if I can get it to highlight here as I want. never does when it, what I want it to do when I want it to do. Okay, apparently. All right, there we go. Okay, so look at what it says here in verse 32. The Hebrew writer uses both the verb and the noun form of this word, and so that's why the, the, uh, the colors are a little different, but they're the same root word. Look at what he says in verse 32 as he's talking here. He says, but recall the former days when after you were enlightened, that is after you became a Christian, after you became a child of God. Recall the former days when after you were enlightened, you endured. You, you bore up underneath these trials. You bore up underneath these struggles. You patiently waited because of someone or something who was to come. You endured, look at what he says, a hard struggle with suffering. You endured a hard struggle with suffering. Then he talks about some of those sufferings that they endured, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, sometimes <clears throat> being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison. You had compassion on those in prison. Watch this. This is amazing. This is an amazing example of hupomone. You joyfully accepted Boy, that's patient endurance. He doesn't use the word there. He uses it here. He'll use it again here. But look at this description of endurance. You joyfully accepted the plundering of your property. Why? Since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. He uses a little play on words here. It's kind of lost in the English. But this word, an abiding one, is the same root word as both of these words. He tells them that they need to endure because they have a possession that will endure and you have need of endurance. So he uses this word, this root word three times. Um, and let's skip down to chapter 12 where he comes back to this word. <laughs> he says, chapter 12, verse 1, Therefore, since we are surrounded by, by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. Let us run with, run with endurance the race that is set before us. He uses this athletic event, this athletic imagery here. Run with endurance the race. Bear up, hold up during the race that is set before you. And again, he tells you how you do this. You look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Look at him. He was the example for us of bearing up, who for the joy that was set before him. See this? We have to run with joy, right? Who for the joy that was set before him 
endured the cross. The cross wasn't the joy. But there was something joyful that was set before him that helped him to endure the cross. Do we have something joyful that we're waiting for that should help us to endure hardships and struggles? Who for the joy that was set before him enduring the cross, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Is that something to be joyful for, to look forward to? If you're Jesus Christ? Then he says in verse 3, Consider him who endured. Who's him? Jesus Christ. Consider him who endured. Same word, right? From sinners, such hostility against himself. Why should we consider Jesus? So that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. That's why we... We should consider him. We should consider him so that in our struggle against sin, we could have him as our example. Look down at verse 7. It is for discipline. And I like this, this word here, discipline. Discipline can actually be translated training. I think it personally fits a little better with the idea here of athletic events. I think that's probably a slightly better translation. And it's a, legit trans, it's a legitimate translation as well. He says, it is for training, if you will let me use that word. It is for training that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not train? But it is for training that you have to endure. You see, when we're enduring these things, it's part of a bigger purpose. It's part of our training. It's part of the training process that we go through. Let's look at another passage here where this word occurs. Go to 1 Peter chapter 2. I have three there. Let's go to chapter 2. He's talking here to servants. He'll talk here in a minute to husbands and wives, but right now he's talking to servants. And he says here in verse 20, talking to the servants again, what credit is it if when you sin, you're beaten for it, you endure? So if, you're, if, you're, if you do something bad and you beat and you endure that, is that a good thing? Not any, you're getting what you deserve. You're enduring what you deserve to endure in that situation. But look at what he says. But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure. If you do good and suffer for the good you're doing, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. This is a gracious thing. What was the good thing they were doing here? What was the good thing he was doing? He was simply living a Christian life. He was simply a servant living the, the life that a servant should be living. That is living, it was living, if you let me look back at verse 19 here. It was a servant who was living, very important point here, key point. It was a servant who was living mindful of God. It's a servant who is living mindful of God. This is a gracious thing. When mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. Meaning that you didn't do anything for this difficult situation. It is a good thing when mindful of God. You see, the servant has, who treated his master with respect because he was mindful of God that is, he was, a Christian, he was a servant, a Christian servant, who was living with God, the center of his mindset. If he endures this mistreatment, if he endures this suffering, while doing the good things, living with God in mind, it is a gracious thing, verse 20. It is a gracious thing in the sight of God. Contextually speaking, talking about this Greek word, hupomone, to be fair, uh, regarding this word, the suffering, the hardships that are happening in these texts, they're generally associated with suffering for the sake of Christ. Um, but sometimes, as I already mentioned, sometimes suffering just happens because we live in a world tainted by sin, where Satan has an impact sometimes, where time and chance, and again, we talked about time and chance last week from the book of Ecclesiastes 9, where time and chance happen. Not everything is because it's God's desire to do this bad thing or whatever as we sometimes want to say well it must be god's will that this thing is happening well god allows things to happen certainly he is in a position to control them but he also has put this place this world in a, in a situation where sometimes time and chance happen and the question that i really want us to consider today really is this question 
What do I look like during these difficult times? What is the key is, as we kind of try to make an application here, what is the key for enduring difficult times? What is the key for us as we go through these times right now? Here's what it really matters. It's keeping our eyes. Here's how we do it. It's by keeping our eyes on what really matters the most. We saw this, first of all, back in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 34. Look at what he says here. Back in 1034, he said, uh, where, where is this? For you had compassion on those in prison. You joyfully accepted the plundering of your property. How were they able to joyfully accept this? Because you knew that you yourselves had a better possession, an abiding one. Because you yourselves knew that you had a possession that would itself endure, so you should endure. You see, these Christians endured because they knew they had something better that was going to come. They looked forward to something down the road. Since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one, an enduring one. We also saw something key to how we um, endure difficult times in 1 Peter. A very similar idea, actually. Uh, at least I think it's pretty similar. When we saw this in chapter 2, verse 19. This is a gracious thing. When mindful of God, when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. You see, living our lives wherever we are, whether it's as a husband, uh, as, a, as a wife, as a child, as a master, employer, as a servant, employee, wherever we are living our lives, maybe you're going through difficult times. He says, living our lives here, essentially is the idea. You're living your life. And if, going back to this text, for if when you are doing good, you're doing good, you're living the life you've been called to do, and you suffer because of your, li your life you're living for Christ, maybe you're suffering for other reasons, maybe you're suffering because time and chance happen, but whatever the case, you're suffering, and if you endure this, and you endure this, why? Because you're hoping to get a raise? Well, I'm going to stick with it. No. You're enduring this. Why are you enduring it? Because you're hoping that somehow you get a, a good payoff in the end? No. You're enduring this because you're mindful of God, verse 19. You see, those are keys. Those are keys uh, as we go through these difficult times. Those are keys that we have to focus on, things that should help us during this time. What really matters is that we have a better possession that will endure itself. It will remain. We have... Uh, we have to keep our eyes on that. What really matters is that we live our lives with God at the center of our thoughts. How do we endure these difficult times? By keeping our mind on God and on His promises. Let us use this time to draw near to God. Let's use this time. Again, it's a difficult time. But let us seek to use this time to draw close to God. Find comfort in that we have promises that are remaining, that will remain a God that is on the throne. Find comfort in each other. Call each other. Encourage each other. Pick each other up. Find out a way that you can be a blessing to someone. You can still keep your social distance. Find a way that you can be a blessing and a comfort. Be a word of encouragement. Be an example in Christ-like endurance. Don't be an example of someone who falls apart during difficult times. Be an example of someone who, in difficult times, lives a life mindful of of God. I want to sing another song here and then we'll say a closing prayer. But let's sing this song, short song that the lyrics there on the screen. A common love for each other, a common gift to the Savior, a common bond holding us to the Lord. A common strength when we're weary, a common hope for tomorrow, a common joy in the truth of God's Word. And again, look at those words. All these things that we have in common, bonds holding us to the Lord, strength when we're weary, hope for tomorrow, joy in the truth of God's Word. Guys, there are things that are going on that are difficult and challenging, nothing that's outside of God's control, nothing that's bigger than Him, and because it's not bigger than our God, it's not bigger than us either.
Let's say a word of prayer at this time. Our Father God, we come before you this morning and we are thankful for the blessings you've given us. We pray that you may help us to bear up during these times, help us to be a light. Father, it's easy to be a light when everything is a blessing and it's easy to be salt when everything is easy. Help us to be light and salt during these times. Help us to be a, an encouragement to those who were maybe alone during these times, to those who might be in greater needs than ourselves, and help us to see the needs of others during this time. Help us not to be so consumed with our own needs. Father, help us to look for, to seek out ways to be a blessing to others at this time. Help us to be mindful of you. Help us to have a mind full of you. We thank you for these blessings, and it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you, guys. Love you guys all. Stay safe.